138 in your hymnals 138 wherever he leads I'll go let's all stand shall we page 138 page 138 take up thy cross and fall second he drew me closer to his side i sought his will to
careful what you sing. He might hold you to it. How many of you are willing to go wherever he leads you? Don't just sing it. I, there's three of you raised your hands. Ready to pray? We'll, we'll pray hard in a minute, but we'll open up now. Ready? Heavenly Father, please Work in the hearts of these kids. Thank you for their excitement. And they're wound up, and I pray that the Spirit of God will get through to them, and speak to their heart, and speak to their soul, and challenge them. And I pray the same for the teens. I know there are some that they are kind of frustrated with, but God, you can get a hold of them, and I pray you will. I pray tonight that you'll challenge us, and Lord, if there's someone that can't be here with us tonight, because of some reason, of course, and we pray that you would answer that prayer if it's not feeling well, if it's an issue. And, Lord, I'm thankful that we can gather and sing and pray, get your word. We need it. Our world needs it. Send us out into this world. You said wherever, we just sang, wherever he leads, I'll go. And, Lord, they, this world, it, it need, they need us. It, the world is so dark. It, it needs us desperately, Lord. Use us, please, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Page 139. Our best. Page 139. Here. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's read scripture. I want to read scripture with you. You need it. I need it. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Find that. We'll read. See, I read my Bible today. Good. Won't hurt you to get too much. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I went to pick up. We have a joke ever since they've been having. It's not a joke. It's true. Ever since we've had this ladies' banquet, 
when my kids were little and home, so I know that we've been doing this quite a while. This week, we have labeled banquet week, meaning don't cross your mother, don't get in her way, she's busy, got a lot on her mind, and we are at her beckon and call. Whatever she needs, we do. Now they're all gone. It's wearing me out. So on Sunday, we begin the process of, I, I, out of the clear blue, I will just say, banquet week! And she knows that we're getting in a, a frazzle together. So she said today, can you go get the tablecloths and the napkins at Monarch? I said, I would be glad to. I said, is it the Monarch out in the industrial park? Yes. So I go out there. I thought I knew where it was. I'm driving back and forth. I don't see any Monarch sign. I'm thinking, I've, it's been a while. We have not had a banquet. It's been yet two or three years because of COVID and the fire. So I thought I knew where it was, and then I realized where it was. Now it was called Wildman. So I pulled in, went to the door, was locked, said go to the side, went to the side, went in, looking around. Nobody's around. Finally, someone said, you need help? I said, yeah, where am I? <laughs> he said, you're at Wildman. I said, no, this is supposed to be Monarch. He said, this hasn't been Monarch for several years. I said, why don't you tell me? So I said, I'm looking for Monarch. He said, it's over on Lincoln Way, the old one. So I shoot over there. I'm praying all the way there. It's Wednesday. This is a busy day for me. I don't have time to be running around. So I get to Monarch, and I know Monarch because it's right by where my dad's barbershop uh, used to be. And so I knew where to go. I ran right up into the office, and the office is all locked down. And I'm, they got a little window with a hole, and I'm yelling in the hole, hey! Pretty soon a lady comes out, comes out that big secure. She goes, can I help you? I go, is this Monarch? She, I knew it was. She said, yes. I said, well, I just went to where you're supposed to be, and you're not there. She said, where is that? I said, in the industrial. Oh, we haven't been there for years. She said, I think. I said, you think? She said, well, we just bought Monarch. My husband and I are the new owners. And I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, I grew up in this neighborhood. I grew up in this office, this building, ran the alleys with the boys who you bought it from. And she said, well, I want you to meet my husband. He's on the phone, but maybe he'll wave. So he was on the phone, and I waved at him. So the lady said, she's going to help you. What do you need? I said, Lakeside Baptist Church, I'm picking up tablecloths and napkins. And the lady said, oh, got it. So she pulled out the paper, and she said, that's 100, 150 bucks. I said, I'll pay you now. And the owner goes, wait a, wait a minute. He said, you don't have to pay if you preach the gospel. I said, say that again. He said, there is no charge if you preach the gospel and I'm thinking, I grew up with the other guy, and he never did that for me. And now the new guy walks in. He goes, listen, if you preach the gospel, people need the gospel. We need gospel-preaching churches. He said, we would be glad to do this for you. I said, man, that is great. I said, it's just encouraging to know that there's other Christians. I asked him if he's a Christian. Yeah, of course. Goes from Valpo. They live that way, and so they're kind of driving this way. But... Thank God. Sometimes you just feel like, what's the use? What's the point? I'm the only one left. Right? The Elijah syndrome. Every, everybody else is saying, I'm the only good one. And then God pops one up. So praise the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, he writes, he says to them, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord 
may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. You know what that means, right? It's all about what God says. What does the Bible say? Preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So he says, pray for us. We want to preach. We want the word of the Lord to have free course. Do you think the government, I hate to cause a commotion, do you think the government would try to stop us from preaching if they could? But wait, pray. You want to pray about it? You don't need to, do you? They don't want us here. In fact, we know they don't want us here because the first guy that came to preach the gospel, they crucified. Right? He didn't do any crimes. I mean, if you're a thief hanging next to him, wouldn't you say, what are you here for? And Jesus would say, preaching the gospel, healing people, helping people, saving people. In fact, after three days, they can kill me, but I, I'm going to rise up from the dead anyway. If you're a thief hanging on that cross, wouldn't you yell down to someone and go, hey, you got the wrong guy over here? Right? Verse 2. And that we may be delivered. From unreasonable and wicked men. Well, let me get this straight. Paul is writing, we believe, correct, 2,000 years prior to now. Are you telling me you had unreasonable and wicked men then? Imagine that. Look at what he says. For all men have not faith. Isn't that the truth? Huh? Can I get a witness? Isn't that the truth? Verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Isn't that all good? I mean, are you just encouraged by that? I am. So encouraged by these words. Remember the Thessalonians were panicking. Someone told them that they had missed the rapture. So in other words, you're stuck in the ground. Okay? So now what? He tells them, no. Just, right? He's already dealt with this, but now he closes his book and he says, verse 5, let God direct you into the patient waiting for Christ. Verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother. I mean, it's bad enough the world is dark. Now he's going after Christians. Do you know any Christians that aren't living right? Shame on them, hey? Love them, but don't agree with them. Let them know. Hey, praying for you. You, you need to live for God. I, I've never met, in all my years, of I've ministered for 42 years. In all those years of ministry, I've never met a Christian who, was right, who wasn't right with God that was blessed. They're all miserable. You know, you should go to church. Yeah. How's things going? Not very good. I've never had any of them say, man, I gave up God, gave up church. Everything's going great. I've never, really. Verse 6, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, Verse 8, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So he said, we, we didn't have to, but we did this because we knew it would be easier for other people to do the right thing. And I read that and think, is my life making it easier for someone else to do the right thing? 
or is my life making it harder for them? Are you listening? Is my life making it easier for other Christians to do that? Even Christians who aren't right with God. I talk to Christians who aren't right with God. I don't ignore them. Don't talk to me. I talk to them. I'm not mean it. Why, why, how will I want to be treated? So he says, we did what we felt we should do so that you, and when he says there, follow us, verse 9. They, they weren't starting a cult or religion. They were following God. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Amen. Wow. That isn't popular today, is it? For we hear, we hear, verse 11, that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all. What a, what a perfect word, but are busy bodies. Isn't that a great word? Busy. You're just, mind your own beeswax. They're just going around trying to figure out everything. He said, verse 12, now, them that are such, we command you and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness, you know what that means? Keep your mouth closed. Do what you're supposed to do. They work, eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, I love this. I love how you know the Spirit of God has guided the writing of this. He said, verse 12, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. What is he just talked about? Challenging other Christians to live right. And then what does he say after he says that? Don't get weary. Look at me, look at me, look at me. The ministry doesn't wear me out. People wear me out. I'm coming Sunday. Hey, where are you about? No, I'm coming this Sunday. That wears me out. I'm not worn out from preaching. I'm tired from preaching. I'm not weary from preaching. I'm weary from promises that aren't kept. What you? And, verse 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Boy, there's a time to buckle down and say, hey, time to straighten up. Right? Time to fly right. Time to live right. Yet, verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy. That's what we do. Other Christians, disobedient Christians are not my enemy. They're just in the way. So we're supposed to help them, you know, Get going the right way. That's what he's saying. They're, they're stopping us from going there. They're, they're making other people not see what they're supposed to do. So he says, admonish him as a brother. Verse 16, I love this verse. Now the Lord, watch this, verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. And then, of course, he signs his name, the salutation of Paul, with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Ladies, Friday night's your big night. If you have questions, if you need to sign up, if the sign-up sheet's still up, should be, right? If you need to sign up, if you have questions, see Amy. Tonight, if you can help. Uh, we're trying to set up tables and chairs. Tomorrow they're also working. I don't know what they're doing, but 10 o'clock they'll be here tomorrow. If you're a lady and would like to help set up table, I mean, decorate, all that lady banquet stuff, you know stuff, that stuff, banquet stuff. Prayer list. Prayer list. Add this name, because we left her off on purpose, but I saw her and felt bad. Crystal, put Crystal on there. She's got a big, she cut her thumb on the paper, so she's wearing a big old arm sling. And No, she had surgery Monday on her wrist, 
and uh, she's healing. So if you need something picked up, don't ask her. Get somebody else. But put her down there. Just pray that she can heal quickly. And put, would you do some stars in there? We're going to pray together. Would you put some stars by some names? Under cancer, would you star Larry McFarland? He was here Sunday, but John sees him a lot. And if they're watching, we're not going to embarrass them. We're just letting you know that he needs prayer. He's fighting, fighting cancer. Okay? We were with a good, man, good friends of ours called the Grahams, Keith and Carol Graham. Mm -hmm. Called. They are in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin now. And they were coming through. They were here back in the 90s. He was a teacher at Penn State. And he would teach all week in Pennsylvania and drive home on the weekends. His wife and girls lived here. Kimberly Sauvage, our missionary to France, this is her mom and dad, Keith and Carol Graham. And so they called to we're coming through. Can we meet you for dinner? We said, we don't believe in dinner, but we'll meet you. We met them for dinner. He is also fighting, Keith, fighting cancer. And maybe you just want to make a note, if you know them or remember. Of course, our missionary, that's her dad, Kimberly Sauvage. That's her dad. Good people. Um, he wrote textbooks for Pensacola. He's very, I said, I don't like being around you because you're an egghead and, you know, but, but we relate. I mean, we just talk about the Lord, and, and he's very smart. He used to teach doctors. He retired from teaching doctors. He knows all this stuff, you know, like where your bones are and all that. And so he taught for years, taught doctors. But we just had, he bought me my first computer. He came to me one day and said, you need to get a computer. I'm going to pay for it. So pick a good one and send me the bill. Well, let me pray about that. Okay, I'll just, just been a blessing. So Keith Graham, Keith Graham. And then right across, Gary Gilmore. Keep praying for Brother Gilmore. And all those people on there, of course, need it. Mark Dykus struggling with a rare, rare, rare cancer. That's Donna's son. Linda Ritter still has a broken foot, I think. Probably it's not over yet. It's been a week. You'd think she'd get over it, but pray that that. I'm kidding. Kevin, how do we pray for Kevin Snyder? Breathing problems? Amen. Okay. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just A-G-E. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Pray for him, though. Would you do that? And then Margaret Jett has been having problems. They discovered it's carpal tunnel. So pray about that for her. Maybe if she'd slap Elizabeth around a little bit, it'd loosen up. But, Or I'll do it, Margaret, if you don't want to. Chandra Ute, see Jeff and Sandra Ute. Sandra Ute is battling. Um, she just got lots of stuff going on, and they're trying to figure it out. They want to be here. They can't be here. They keep in touch. Pray hard for her. Would you maybe just underline her name and pray for her? And uh, Janie Lykoff's mom, not doing good, way down, second from the bottom. Would you put a star and pray? Is she still in the hospital? She's still in the hospital waiting on a pacemaker. But, okay. How many of you believe God can heal? How many of you wish God would heal more? Go ahead and say it. He's a, he can read your mind. I mean, maybe, maybe we're supposed to believe more. Huh? Remember John 14, 14? If ye shall... Ask anything in my name, I will do it. I think sometimes we're praying, but I don't know that we're praying in his name. Like, really, I'm trying to preach to the choir, but they're not up here. 
We're talking, we're praying, but are we praying in his name? Just think now. If he, he said, if he, he said that, that's it, John 14, if ye shall ask anything in my name. So when we're praying, are we really saying, oh, Jesus, I believe you died for me. I know you can do this. I'm asking this. I mean, I'm, I'm the preacher. I'm supposed to tell you that. I'm, I'm saying it to me. Are we really? I mean, I close every prayer. Don't you? In Jesus' name. But it's more than that. It's not this magic phrase, we end to the end. We add to the end in Jesus' name. Is he listening when I pray? We, yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, do we believe if we ask anything in his name? Did they think he was going to rise from the dead? Did he tell them he was? So they chose to follow their feelings rather than what he said. Look at me. Look at me. That's what we do. I have people say to me, hey, I'll go, man, you're having trouble. Have you prayed about it? Yeah, I just don't feel like the Lord. Whoa, 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 whoa. If he said it, let's pray. Pray, do what you want. Kneel, lay down, sit, stand. Whatever works for you, I'm going to kneel. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And as I just admonish myself and all of us and anybody watching, we need to ask in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you that you came. You came for the world. But each of us calls upon you, has called, uh, for you to be our Savior. And we believe that you at that moment applied your blood to our sin directly, personally. We believe at the moment we called upon you that you exchanged your righteousness. We know that happened on the cross. But when we finally saw it, we believe when we, when we trusted you, when we called on you, when we asked you to save us, we know and, and believe at that very moment that we had become children of heaven, sons of God. You said, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power. So, Lord, we come praying tonight with that same faith, that same belief that these folks that we're praying for, that you would do, uh, God, what, what they need. Not what we want, but our prayer, as we think about these folks, like Larry, Larry McFarland, Lord, you, you can heal him up. You can just, however you do it, we always think of you have to touch someone and you don't. You just have, have to say the word, as the Bible teaches us, and he'll be healed. So that's our prayer for him. And we're, we're asking the same for Gary Gilmore, we're asking the same. For Christy Cliff, we're asking the same. For Mike, Mark Dykus and every person battling cancer, Keith Graham, Lord, they, they don't know what to do. They're doing everything the doctor says. But now we believe that when Jesus said, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's where we're at, Lord. We need you. God, we need you to answer prayer. We need to know that when we're praying, we're not just talking, we're not just saying words, we're not just going through a, a, a formality. We're talking to, to our Heavenly Father, the God of the universe. And Lord, that's what I'm doing at this very moment. So my prayer is for healing for these others, for Linda Ritter and for Kevin Snyder and his breathing and and, Lord, so many. Margaret now has this problem in her wrist, carpal tunnel. Help her with that. And help Crystal to heal. Help that to heal up, heal right, and heal quickly. And, Father, uh, for Janie's mom, who uh, this is to us, Lord, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what you're going to do. But you said when you pray, believe I can do something about it. So that's what we're doing. We're trusting you to do what? 
God, you can do. It may not be exactly what we want, but we trust you, Lord. Please work at her physically. And for Janine, as she gets ready for, ready for major surgery, that you would help her to gain strength. And, Lord, I pray uh, for uh, Sandra Yu, who is just struggling and in pain. And, and God, the doctors are trying. Uh, so, uh, Lord, we need to ask you first. We need to trust you first, maybe. Thank you for doctors. Thank you for those that help us. But, Lord, we know that you get all the honor when we uh, just rely on you. If we try to get to heaven by helping you, you you said, no, no, neither is there salvation in any other. So, Lord, we realize that our salvation is in you only, and you don't need any help. And as we pray tonight, may that be our prayer as we ask it in Jesus' name, that Jesus doesn't need any help, but he can do it. So our prayer as we bring these folks before you is please work in them, please heal them. I'm asking this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers are coming. Scott, when are you leaving? Friday? Sunday. They're leaving Sunday to go down to Pensacola. Samuel, pray for them as they travel. I'm going to put Browns. You say it how you want. Travel Sunday. You better be listening to us as you're traveling or watching us. Huh? She's got laryngitis. Good. I mean, oh. From yelling? Talking too much on the phone? God's judgment? See, you're blowing me off. Like, do you want us to pray for you? Huh? Huh? heard <laughs> she needs it her dad and mom are too nice to her yeah we're glad you're here brown you too snyder <laughs> ready let's pray father thank you for how you supply thank you that when we're in a tough spot it's not desperate Sometimes we're desperate and we come to you, but God, it's never out of control. Thank you for that. Be with Sarah. Help her voice to clear up. Take that away from her, Lord, please. And give the brown safety as they travel, Scott and Carol and Samuel, as they travel down to Florida and take a little time away. Just bless them. Be with them. I'm asking this in Jesus' name. Amen. In your hymnals, where he leads me, I'll follow. Let's all stand. 140.
be seated, Amen. Pastor. Joshua, thank you. Joshua, Joshua, chapter 6. Joshua. Pray for the king's kids. I, I don't know, you know, some of you know what's going on. They're, they're, just, they're just kids, okay? I would hate to be a worker if I was in Awana. Can you imagine? So you hear them, they're loud, but they've just been very disrespectful. You can't make me. Really? If I would have said that 50 years ago, I would be crippled. Hello? Tell a nun, you can't make me. Oh, really? Joshua chapter 6. So just pray about that because we can't. We can't touch them. We can't make them. And they come to homes, man. I can remember. One of my best friends growing up, it was like, Sixth grade or younger, I can remember he came over one time. We'd get together all the time, and we were playing, and he said, come in the garage. I need to tell you something. I'll never forget this. How old was I when I was sixth grade? Ten or 11? So that was 30, 20, 30 years ago. I know, I know. I remember him saying, "Come, to, I want to tell you something in the garage. So we get in the garage, and he goes all the way over, away from the doors. Isn't that funny what you remember? He goes over by the wall. It was an old dirt floor, dirt floor garage, that brown asphalt, shingles, junk, ugly, ugly. And I remember him, you know, we're, we're way over by the wall, and he starts crying. He said, I got to tell you something. And I go, his name was Bill. I go, Bill, what's up? And he goes, my parents are getting a divorce. Do you realize how rare that was then? Do you know that the, the Christian ratio compared to the world ratio of divorce is the same? Joshua chapter 6. These kids are growing up and... Wow. I mean, unbelievable conditions. Hey, so, man, thank God for parents, whoever they are, divorced or not. If they're doing all they can for their kids, that's you got to do that. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Joshua 6, you know this story, and I do too, but I feel like I need a reminder of it. Joshua 6. Can we read a good portion of it? Would you hold on? We might go kind of fast. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now, Jericho, you remember, we're not going to go that fast. When God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage and led them towards the promised land, which should have been an 11-day journey, and they squeezed it into 40 years, now, now they are entering Canaan land. But of course God said, I'll get you in. And I'll give you victory. Watch now, because this is the Christian life. I'm going to give you everything that I promised. But you're going to fight for it. Watch now, but you're going to win. You know, there's a, it's like dying knowing you're going to be raised from the dead. That kind of takes a sting out of death, right? So our Lord knew that when he died, these other two guys would stay dead. One would go to hell, right? One would go to hell, and one would be with him. So as they enter the promised land, God says, Trust me. So they're ready to fight. They get, they get to Jericho. I can remember riding in the bus in, in the Holy Land. 
I can remember the tour guide saying, look out the right side of the bus. See that mound? It was just a mound of dirt. He said, that used to be Jericho. It's all that's left. It's just a big mound of dirt. No people, no nothing. Just, just, hey, when God deals with something, he deals with it. Verse 1, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. They're hiding behind their wall. And the Lord said, verse 2, unto Joshua, see? He wanted him to see it. He didn't just want him to hear it. We walk by faith, not by sight. But God said, hey, Joshua, I want you to see this. This is going to happen. Can you see it? That, that's what that means. See, I, verse 2, I've given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. They never knew what was going to happen. Remember, sometimes, in fact, after, after this battle, they got overly confident, went into battle, less prepared than they should be. And God said, well, I, okay, go ahead. Wiped a bunch of them out, and then they start crying, what, what are you doing? And God says, hey, you're supposed to trust me. This isn't about you. This isn't about what you think. is isn't what you feel. It's what I say. They never knew when they went into battle. David knew when he went into battle against Goliath that, that God would not tolerate this. This wasn't... David's battle. Verse 3, he gives them these specific directions. Odd, this is just oddball. Hey, this isn't a battle. This is a parade. Verse 3, you should compass the city, all ye men of war. That's not what they're trained to do. Walk, walk around. Notice it said, do you see it? Verse 3, ye men of war, go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. Do you ever feel in your Christian life, you know, you don't always know you're growing when you're growing. But if you do what you're supposed to be doing, you'll grow. So you don't do it because you feel like you're growing. You do it. I read my Bible. I pray because I know that that's what I need to do to grow. Whether I feel like I'm growing or not, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Circle the city. Six days. Do it again. Do you ever feel like you're going through it and not much is happening? That's where this story is so encouraging. See, it was only six days, I know. Verse 4, and seven priests shall bear before the ark. See the ark? That's God. God's presence. The symbol of God's presence. You know why they could circle this city and not do anything? And, and you know the story, right? The walls fall down. That didn't happen because they were good marchers. That happened because God was there. He said, compass the city, all you men of war, verse 3, go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. Okay? Same pattern, verse 4. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn, and the seventh day, okay, new thought. They're supposed to do that all the other days. But on the seventh day, and the seventh day, ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpet. And it shall come to pass, verse 5, that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. 
and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Verse 6, and Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, take up the ark of the covenant. That's God. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we need to take God with us to our battles. God needs to go before us. He's the one that needs to fight the battles. Say, well, he's already here at church. I don't need him. Yeah, I know. We need to take him. So, so Joshua gets it. Joshua says, hey, take verse 6. Take the Ark of the Covenant, let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. Verse 7, and he said unto the people, pass on, compass the city, let him that is armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. Verse 8, it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men, verse 9, went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the re-reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua, verse 10, had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. Verse 11, So the ark of the Lord, there's God again, he keeps showing up in this story. You know, I'm afraid that when we preach this story, we leave him out. You know the story of, of Joshua uh, fought the battle of Jericho? No, he didn't. God did. Joshua was just there. When we pray and God answers prayer, God didn't do that because you asked. God did that because he's God. You're not a good asker. He's a good giver. We can't take credit. Verse 11. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once. They came to the camp and lodged in the camp. Joshua rose up early in the morning, verse 12, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. There's God again. And seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord, there's God again, went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the re-reward came after the ark of the Lord, there's God again, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. Verse 14, and the second day they compassed the city once and returned to the camp, so they did six days. Verse 15, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose up early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. Verse 16, and it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Verse 17, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Pray with me. Lord, help us now. Speak to us now. Encourage us, please. Help us to know that you have to be in every, every area of our life. Worship, yes but especially in our battles. We want to trust you, Lord. We want to do what you tell us to do. Sometimes it's hard. It's hard for armed soldiers to not fight and not talk and not say anything and to keep doing that. They did it for six days. On the seventh day, they did it seven times. And they didn't, they didn't fight, they didn't battle, they didn't, they didn't in any way try to stir anything up. They just did what you told them to do. And then you did what you wanted to do. And Lord, how we need that in our lives. We just need to keep doing what you tell us to do. And if we don't like it, we need to keep doing it. Because you told us to do it. 
If we don't understand it, we need to keep doing it. If we want to talk and complain and, and grumble and murmur, we just need to keep our mouth shut and do exactly what you want us to do and keep doing it and wait for you to work. That's exactly what happened at Jericho. They put you, they put you in their battle and they trusted you. It wasn't about them. It was about you. It was about what you said. It was about how you said it. And you came through. I pray we'll trust you to do the same in our lives when it seems like sometimes we just keep doing the same thing and nothing's happening. But we need to do what we're supposed to do. Thank you, Lord. Work in our hearts. Please work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. They marched around the city. You don't have to have skill to do that. You know what makes you march around the city and not fight and not talk? Character. It took character. They didn't, they didn't go, this is really dumb, isn't it? They weren't supposed to talk. And if they were thinking it, I hope they felt bad. No noise, no cheering. Even if they believed God was going to do this, he said, nothing. No complaining, no doubting. What were the people of Jericho thinking? I'll tell you what they were thinking. What are they doing? Wasn't that, wasn't that, I don't know the proper term. Wouldn't that blow your mind? Look at all these guys. They're all armed. Hey, and look, the reason they're shut up is because the, the people of Jericho didn't want to go out because they heard about God. So now they're seeing all these soldiers and they're seeing God. What's that gold box? Someone said, you dummy, that's God. And they said, man, they've got God. And they're, they're taking God on a trip around our walls. Wouldn't you, think, wouldn't you think if you're living in Jericho behind those walls and you see all these soldiers, you see God in a box going around your city, wouldn't you think we are doomed? And then after one day, nothing. They go to bed, they go, man, nothing happened. That was God in the box, right? That was God. See all them horns? Man, that, no, that was him. Next day they get up. Hey, psst, come here, look, they're back. And they've got God again. They're thinking, man, oh, th this isn't going to, two days of this, God's going to, this is going to be bad. The second day ends, nothing happens. Say, so you're going to go all, through all seven days? Third day, they wake up. Somebody says, do you see them? They're out there again. Someone said, is God with them? God's with them. Out there. Man, he's right out there. Well, that, that, this is bad. Three, three is a biblical number. This is probably the day of our doom. They finish. They all go home. The people behind the walls in Jericho, they go to sleep. Fourth day. Here they are again. Seventh day. We'll skip some. Want to skip some? Let's skip some. They get to the seventh day, and here they are. Hey, they're here. Seventh day. Seventh day. There they are. And, and they're, hey, wait a minute. They're not going home. They, they, you, they all week, they made one lap. Now they're making another lap. Hey, now they're making they're their third trip. Here's what happens. About the seventh trip on that seventh day, all those people in Jericho said, watch, 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 nothing's going to happen. It, if it didn't happen by now, it isn't going to happen. Here's what the Bible says about you and I waiting for the Lord. Ready? For in such an hour, as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. 
We better be ready. I don't care if it's good or bad. I don't care if we all go to jail and we can't meet for church, and I don't care if we have a, a, a worldwide revival. He's coming back. It doesn't matter what you think or how you think or when you think or why you think. The army is marching around Jericho. They march seven and six. I don't know how your math is. Thirteen times. You and I say, that's an unlucky number. It is if you live in Jericho. God, the walls in your life, God can knock down any way he wants. Don't fuss with him the way he does it. Just trust him. Notice a couple of things. Let me count, make sure I'm in a God. Just two, just two. Number one, God's presence is the key. Got to be about, you got to talk about God. You got to put God out in the front. You got to say God knows what he's doing. I've studied God's word. I believe this is what God wants. I trust God. I've just got to know God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So all I have to do is seek God, and he'll take care of everything else. You realize, don't you? Don't you? That the Christian life is more than you showing up in church. This is the good part. Well, not if we're, you're sitting out here. No, this is the good part. It's out there. It's where it's ugly and, and people don't like us and, and the world is dark. You and I have to just have God in our life in the routine, in the mundane. Just bring him in. Talk to him at night before you go to bed. Read his word before you go to bed. Get up in the morning. Start the morning. Talk to God. Read his word. Use the day to talk to other people about God. Tell people about God. Invite them to church. You and I have to have a good routine. If we fail in the routine, we'll fail. You'll fail in life. You've got to do the things you're supposed to do. You ought to go to church. you got to just go round and round and round. Even though sometimes church might feel like you're just walking around walls, God will bless. Just wait on God. When God's ready, he'll, he'll blow the thing apart. Everybody likes blessing and victory. But we struggle with unconditional obedience. Just saying, God, I'll do whatever you want. And that's what we, we're Lakeside Baptist Church. We're Christians. But this church, well, let's talk about this church. We have to have the attitude that we just need to be quiet and trust God and obey him. What does he want us to do? Keep doing what we're supposed to be doing. We don't need to be entertained. We need to be we need to have character. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. He said that you study, this is a great verse. He said that you study to be quiet. I hate this verse. He said study to be quiet and do your own business. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. When he says study to be quiet, he's literally talking there about keeping still and not doing anything but God's will. These soldiers in this story, Joshua chapter 6, did exactly what God told them to do. The people that carried God and the people that blew the horns. Man, they're thinking, this is God. We need to be blowing these horns. Joshua said, no, no, no. God said... One time for six days, seven times on the seventh day, after the seventh time, then blow the horns. 
I was cutting Dr. Cedarholm's hair in college. I said, Dr. Cedarholm, I know God wants me to preach. He called me to preach, but he never called me to school. That was a dumb thing to say. He said, so let me get this straight, Brother Rowley. He called me Brother Rowley. Let me get this straight, Brother Rowley. Are you saying that God doesn't want you to be prepared to serve him? I said, I never said that. He said, well, you're saying that you're going to preach, but you don't need to prepare. I said, I would have hacked his hair off if he had any. He said, listen, brother. He stopped. He kind of shifted so he could look at me, and I pulled around, and he said, you want God to find you if he comes back. You want him to find you where you're supposed to be. He said, and if he called you here, he called you here to finish. And you better be where you're supposed to be. He said, I know sometimes it gets, you know, you, you have a hard, he said, you're a married student, you've got kids, you're cutting hair, you're preaching. I, sometimes it just gets overwhelming. I can remember when money would come in. I had a couple that would send in money. I mean, they'd send $1,000, $1,500 to my school bill. And he would call me into his office. He said, you know this couple? I said, yes, sir. He said, they sent this money to put in your school bill. I said, well, ma'am, that's great. And he goes, you probably need tires on your car, don't you? I said, well, matter of fact, I do. He said, you probably need food for your kids, don't you? I said, a matter of fact, I do. He said, not this money. This money has been designated to put on your bill God will take care of your needs if you trust him. Great lessons. Hey, great lessons. There are a lot of things that we do that don't make sense, but God wants us to do it. God's presence is the key. Number two, we need to follow God's directions. God wants you to go to church. I, I don't fuss. When somebody starts fussing, about, I can't crazy at home. I just say, hey, have a great day. Because they don't want they don't want to be changed. They want to they want to excuse what they're doing. If you love God and you want to do what God says, listen to me, you'll be in church. God doesn't have to twist your arm to love him and do what he wants. Amen. You may not get a full explanation. Just do what God says. You're not God. He sees us differently. I'm required to obey God whether I know why or not. I don't understand all the Bible, but I'm obligated to obey all of it. And every time I or you disagree with God, let me help you. He's right. You're wrong. God blessed us based on our effort. We need God's presence. We need God's presence. We need to get alone with God and make sure we have God's presence in our life. Listen to me. You say, preacher, I'm not even sure what that means. God knows what it means. So if you go to God and you say, God, I need your presence. I need your presence in my life. I need your presence when I'm alone. I need your presence when I'm at work. I need your presence at home with my wife, my husband, my kids. I need your presence, God. He'll do it for you. And number two, you ask him to help you follow his directions. Lord, what do you want me to do? Did you ever put something together? You didn't need directions. Then you had to take it all apart because you didn't do one step that you should have done. And now you realize if you would have followed the directions. So now it took you twice as long. Hello. That's exactly what the Christian life is. Follow the directions. What about all those people that are going to get to heaven, stand before God, and God says, you're not getting in. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but what? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I need your presence in my life. I need your presence all the time. I need it to preach. I need it when I'm, when I'm alone. I need it when I'm with my wife. I need it when I'm, I, I'm around strangers. 
I need it everywhere I go. I need your presence. I need it for every battle. I need your presence, God, in, in my everyday routine, walking in circles. I need your presence, and I need to follow your direction. God, I need to follow your direction. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. You might just say tonight, preacher, I, I need that. Those two things. I need, I need his presence. I need God's presence. And I need to follow his directions. Would you pray for me? Is that you? Here's my hand. Uh, preacher, I need to do that. I just need his presence in my life. I need his presence and I need to follow his directions. That's me, preacher. Here's, just, here's my hand, preacher. I, I want him to know I, I need to do that. I need to do that. Slip it up. This is for you. Not for me. This is for you. Preacher, I need to do that. I need to do that. Lord Jesus, please, we need your presence. We need people to see God and smell God and hear God when they're around us. Everything we do in every battle, they need to see God. In every church service, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, they need to see God. Thank you, Lord. Help us, God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.